I was fortunate to work for a company where if you made an honest effort and it was a failure, there was no penalty. There was nobody saying, oh, you know, you derailed your career or you're a really stupid person or whatever. There was like, no, oh, what can we learn from this and how do we move on? And I think that can easily apply to any kind of outdoor activities. Welcome to Driven By. I'm Sam Coates. On this show, I talk to people who have boldly blazed their own trail. I break down what drives them, the risks they take, what they've learned, what's most important to them, the ups and downs along the way, and I hope this helps you find what drives you. My guest this week is Jim and Amy Yurchenko. Jim and Amy have a fascinating story. It's not every day you hear from someone who has maintained their career and hiked tens of thousands of miles in 10 countries, ridden over 4,000 miles, and canoed the Mississippi River. During this episode, we cover knowing your principles early on and living them out, what it takes to do that, time moves fast, no one starts as a master builder, experiencing the natural world, properly preparing for an adventure, being willing to fail because you're willing to learn, how to make your mark on the world, and more. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Hey, everybody. I'll just make this easy. Do you need insurance? Do you want another opinion about your insurance? Just go ahead and call Matt Haga with State Farm. It'll be easy. If you're thinking about it, just do it. We do have listeners to this show from all over the world. So this offers only for listeners in the state of Tennessee and Mississippi in the United States. Matt Haga State Farm offers auto, home, renters, business, and life insurance. Go to MattHaga.com. That's M A T T H A A G A.com and contact them. When you contact Matt, tell him I sent you. Now, more than ever, it is harder to fly. That's why you need to know of AB Jets. If you want to be efficient with your time and fly with one of the safest private air companies in the world, then you need to use AB Jets. AB Jets has received the prestigious Argus Platinum rating the last eight consecutive years, which goes to less than 5% of operators in the world. AB Jets is one of the largest Lear 60 jet companies in the United States with nonstop access to most destinations around the U.S. Efficient, clean, and easy to work with, AB Jets is an experience that gets you where you need to go on time and with no hassle. Go to abjets.com for more information and book your trip today or call them at 888-520-JETS. That's J-E-T-S. Now we're going to get back to the show. Jim, Amy, great to see y'all. Thank you for having us. So y'all are in Silicon Valley, correct? Well, we live in Palo Alto and that's considered part of the valley. The valley, of course, is an amorphous concept. <laughs> I'm curious, in between all these trips that y'all record and publish, what y'all's day-to-day look like? You know, Amy, unfortunately, I know that you said that you broke your ankle recently and you're recovering from that and supposed to have a great recovery. But if that had not happened, are there any daily hikes or practices that y'all do by being such a lover of outdoors? Well, that, that question has a, a pre-COVID and a during COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we live in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we go on long day hikes on the average once a week here. And a long day hike is sunrise to sunset. We're blessed wow. to be in a place with so much public land and so much diversity of habitat. So our day-to-day life includes that. My day-to-day life includes playing pickleball almost every day. Um, All right. That feeds my social life and my get out in the sun every day needs. Pickleball's taken off. It is. <laughs> It's the best. Yeah. We, we have these people that live down the street from us. We live in the city of Memphis, but kind of in more of a suburban area. And these people just somehow got this family home or some, I don't think they bought the home. I think it was passed through the family. It's a large home, about an acre, a little bit larger lot, but they only use it for pickleball. And it, it looks like a country club every day. I mean, there's Eight, 10, 12 cars, people just rotating through playing pickleball in the tennis courts. It's, it's wild. Yes, it's the best. Yeah. Amy, when did you retire from Intuit? 
I retired in 2007. Was that the last nine to five job that you had? Uh, yes, that was the last nine to five job. I retired and spent about five years, five, six, seven, eight years helping my parents age. So I sort of shifted from the job of working, pushing buttons for a living to working in a much more gratifying way of helping my parents. Yeah, that's where my mother-in-law has been for the last six, seven years. It's crazy that time frame, how it just fell right into that. Yeah. And then Jim, you retired in 2012, is that right? About five years ago, plus minus. And I've continued to do a little bit of consulting on a case-by-case basis because I enjoy practicing my craft and I enjoy working with people. And so I've done some consulting back at IDEO and I've done some consulting for non-IDEO clients as well. And that's kind of slowing down now. I'm not really actively seeking it. Sometimes my name gets passed around and someone will propose something. And if it's interesting, I might get engaged. But it's not a career. It's, it's an act, as I say, it's a way to continue to remain involved in using the skills that I've developed over time. Was 2003 the first long excursion that y'all took to the Sierra Nevadas? Was that the first extended trip? Oh, no. Well, my first trip to the Sierra of serious nature would be back in the 70s when I arrived out in California to graduate school. My first long, well, 11-day wilderness trip in the Sierras was in 1973. Okay, so this is something that y'all have done annually since the 70s. Well, so to go back, I started before I could walk. My, parent, my family did a lot of camping and hiking. And I did throughout my childhood and college and into adulthood. The reason that we fell in love with each other was partly because we have a shared passion for being outdoors. Um, so we were doing, we were spending essentially all of our free time hiking yeah. when we met. Yes. And so the Sierras are interesting and in they're an absolutely fabulous place to go, but they have a, a really limited peak season of roughly two months. And we tend to go to places when they're at their best. And so we will usually do a couple of trips a year or so to the Sierra in September, October, which we've learned over time is really the best time to go. But we go to a lot of other places as well and have been. And if you looked at our trip reports, there's a lot of travel that is not yet described in there, both domestic and foreign. Really? We started writing trip reports when we built our website, which was, what, three or four years ago. And so I think we have everything that we've taken since then, and we've been gradually working on historical trips. So there wasn't really a a gap of an extended period of time that y'all did not take trips? No. No. And we also traveled extensively uh, overseas for birding purposes. So we've taken, I don't know, 15 or so trips to foreign countries just to look at birds, not specifically for hiking. How old were y'all when y'all met and knew the love that both of y'all had for the outdoors? What, what did that look like? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. My, well, I'm the youngest of five, and my eldest brother went to college with Jim when I was, you know, 10 years old. <laughs> so I knew of Jim Yurchenko, but had never met him. But Jim and my brother were climbing partners, and they spent a lot of time in the backcountry together in the, I guess, late 60s and 70s. I ended up on living on my brother's couch when I <laughs> needed a place to live and didn't have any money. <laughs> so it wasn't until I moved into my brother's, onto my brother's couch in San Francisco that I met Jim. So I had known his name for 10 or 15 years before that. Wow. So, in, you know, in my mind, he was already pre-qualified and he knew my brother because of their shared passion for being in the backcountry. And I shared that with my brother because that's how we grew up. So it was a pretty natural transition. Yeah, our first, our first date was a trip to Big Sur, backpacking trip yeah. to Big Sur. So. Yeah. Wow. That's where my wife and I went on our honeymoon. Oh, uh, good for you. Excellent. It's beautiful. Marvelous yes. backcountry there. Yes. So early on, from the very early stages of y'all's relationship, it was this mutual passion and interest and aspect of life that you were willing to sacrifice for. So, and that drew y'all together. Is that right? 
I would say it was a central principle of being outdoors together. Mm-hmm. For, for many years, we had a standing date every Sunday to go for a long day hike. Wow. That we really never missed, unless we had a wedding to attend or something. Yeah, it, it formed the common interest and shared thread of our relationship from the beginning. And really was, a for each of us, our most important personal passion that we'd had in our lives for a long time before we met. Was there a feeling that you got early on, let's say in your early 20s, late 20s, of those long day hikes that you still get today that keeps you in the game, so to speak? Oh, yeah. Yes. What is that? Well, part of it is just the physical being outdoors, that both of us had office jobs, and uh, I engaged in a lot of business travel, and so having an opportunity to have complete change of environment and get outside was part of it. And so in some ways, being outside, it doesn't matter enormously what we're doing. I mean, we go hiking, we'll bicycle, we'll birding, whatever. Being outdoors is really, really important. And we both enjoy the natural world. We enjoy its diversity. We enjoy how accessible it is. It's, it's all laid out in front of you. And we both enjoy how much stuff we don't know. That you see things on trips, almost every trip we'll see something we don't understand. And so that's kind of keeps you interested. And specifically birds, which we love. Birds are individuals, and so they engage in behavior that is different from one to another. And they, every time you go out and look at birds, you see one doing something, say, I've never seen them do that before. <laughs> and so it's not surprising. It's people do the same thing. You've never seen a person do this before. Why not birds? And birds live their lives right out in front of you. They, as soon as they're aware of you and realize you're not a threat, they just go on and do what they do. And anywhere you go, there's birds and they can take over your life. Let me build on and add to what Jim just said. Please do. I just took some notes on your question of what's so satisfying about spending a whole day outdoors. The first thing is just the sheer beauty, the aesthetic pleasure of seeing landscapes and animals and plants and things that are pleasing to look at. Second was the intellectual stimulation. Jim mentioned you always see something you didn't, didn't understand or know anything about. I mean, even, even places where we've spent places close to home where we've spent a couple hundred days hiking, we'll go and we'll see something we didn't see. Um, Just before I broke my ankle, I was hiking and I saw a, horsehair worm emerging from a dead cricket. And I I was completely astonished. Like I'd never heard of or seen or imagined such a thing. And it's always like that. There's always something to be endlessly fascinating. The third one Jim mentioned, just being outdoors, exercising all day and walking is enough exercise to feel like you're doing something, but you can do it for six or eight or 10 or 12 hours. It's not physically exhausting. So it's, to me, it's exactly the right, the right activity to be able to spend all day. And I think the fourth one combines several of those, but so much of the things we experience in life were created for the purpose of entertaining us or catching our attention or convincing us to buy something or do something or created to please us. So movies or restaurants or shopping centers or any, you know, sporting events. And the natural world just is what it is. It's not there for our pleasure and it's not structured to please us. And there's something incredibly gratifying about, you know, we call it the real world, which is probably a misnomer, but there's something gratifying about just being in a place that doesn't give a hoot about who we are and getting to see it and experience it. There's an episode that I'm releasing tomorrow and the person talks about the same thing that you're talking about except you take it deeper and he talks about how this journey it broke him just physically emotionally in a healthy way like it just stripped him away of these things that get layered on on top of us but I'm curious I've never heard anybody take it as deep as the way that you just took it where you know like marketing food relationships a lot of the times are you know, technology, dopamine, et cetera. Everything is to trigger us, for us, to appeal to us, et cetera. 
but the way that you just laid that out, is there an application of that that you've seen and try to live by daily to where you try to live in a way where you kind of get out of this advanced world that manipulates the way things were in the created order to try to keep that humility or that detached perspective? It's a good deep question. I'm not sure that I can answer it. I've never thought about it in that way. I'm sure that spending enough time outdoors just creates a mindset of there's a big world out there that's not about serving humans. But I don't think of it as a sort of a daily practice of incorporating that and deliberately creating a worldview based on it. Yes, ma'am. I think something I'm thinking about right now is, let's say y'all's trips, the Mississippi River, it's 2,200 miles, took y'all 58 days. Is there a piece of that that helps you kind of incorporate this in your life? So if you're going to go on the river for 60 days and be detached and be away, is there humility that you feel like you've seen and live with to where you, you don't feel things revolve around you maybe as much as somebody does that's constantly on their phone or constantly staying in their comforts? We're both laughing because it definitely does not revolve around you. <laughs> right. There's no, there's no illusion that anything revolves around you when you're on the river. Yeah. Yeah, the river is so much bigger than you are in every respect. You know, it's history, it's physicality, it's strength, it's beauty, and you are just a little thing moving down it. It's, it your place is, is unambiguous. Yeah. When you're traveling uh, on the river or other trips, you're kind of paying attention to what you're doing. You're not just, we're basically not online for most of these trips in any way. We deliberately don't read newspapers. We don't listen to radio. We, of course, don't, we're not watching television. We're rarely connected, except when we're looking for a weather report online. Mm -hmm. So you're living much more in the world as it is. Mm -hmm. And the trip requires you to focus on what you're doing. If you want to travel safely, you, you really can't be too distracted from where you're putting your foot or where that next eddy is going to take you on the river. So there's an immediacy to like, I just have to pay attention. And you're paying attention to what you're doing and you're paying attention to the bigger picture around you. And that kind of consumes a lot of the sort of drift of mind that you can get when you're not as busy and not as engaged in something that might tend to distract you to some of other things in life that that you're alluding to. But it doesn't sound like there was a significant switch for this lifestyle. It seems like y'all have always kind of been that way. Grew up with it. Yeah. Yeah. What about from a career standpoint, Jim, I know you're at IDEO and Amy, you were at Intuit, and I'm not sure where before that, but y'all are in San Francisco, tech capital of the world. Jim, you're a mechanical engineer and on the team that provided Apple the first mouse. You know, Amy, you had management positions with Intuit. You know, there's this thought outside looking in, you know, when you have these responsibilities and these wonderful careers where more just gets piled on, more gets asked. And, and when you get more, you can make more money and, and you can climb. I mean, did y'all, can y'all say anything about tension of trying to understand your own principles, your own values, and to still do work in a meaningful way, but then also try to not let it overtake this passion and desire that y'all have. Yeah, I'll be happy to talk about that, and I'll go first, and Jim has a different story. My studies were in ecology, forest ecology in particular, and I had no long-term plan to work in software development. I ended up there randomly because for random reasons, I ended up living in San Francisco on my brother's couch. And when you live in San Francisco, software development is a career that pays money. So I had a critical point where I needed to decide whether to go to graduate school and study either ecology or wildlife biology, or get a job that would pay my bills and then use my free time to pursue my passions. And that's a, that's a big, important question that most people who have an option of a career face of, am I going to try to have a career that is really the thing I'm most passionate about? Or am I going to have a career that's satisfying and pays enough money that I can pursue my passions um, outside of that career? 
So I made a deliberate decision to pursue a career that would pay my bills and have my passions be not part of that career. And I loved software development. I really enjoyed the creative process. I enjoyed the collaborative teamwork nature of it. I enjoyed the people that I worked with immensely, but I don't have any, there's nothing in my heart that speaks to software development. Um, so for me, it was, it was a single decision to think of my career as a way of earning a living and never missed a beat on pursuing the things that I'm passionate about with my free time. Did you ever go through a, a period of time where you questioned that and you wish that you might have gone all in? I, I probably would have if I hadn't ended up in a career that I really enjoyed. Like I was never miserable doing software development. Like I said, my inner heart doesn't care about software, but the work itself was immensely fun and gratifying. So for me, I did not have, I didn't second guess it, but I could easily imagine that I would have had I been in a career that was frustrating or irritating. You asked about sort of balancing my personal passions and what I love to do to feed my heart and my soul and how to mix that with the career. I was never trying to advance my career, get promotions, either for purposes of more money or more um, satisfaction. I think partly because I define myself, what's important to me and what's important to who I am is not about career achievement. So like I said, I really loved it and I felt like I found a niche that worked for me. But I was always clear that, you know, when I took a job, I needed to be able to take time without pay because vacations were so important to me. That was just a prerequisite of a, of a company that I would work for. And I don't, I never regretted it. I never had regrets about it. Would it have been a different deal if you worked for a company that was very demanding in the hours and the schedules that they required from a growth standpoint? Yes, I, I did work for a company that was very demanding. Um, I worked there only for seven months. I had worked for a company for 10 years that I really liked, and I followed my boss to a, new, to a startup that was a very different personality. The company was a different personality, and I did not enjoy it. I didn't enjoy the culture and the, the expectations of work, and so I left not long after starting. Mm. And the next time... I looked for a job from le after leaving that one. I was much more deliberate about what's important to me about the culture of the company, about both how they respect work-life balance, but just also how they treat each other and the collaborative process and respect for coworkers. So those things were very important to me. And I made one mistake in going to a company that didn't have the culture that mattered to me. Yes, ma'am. And then I went to Intuit and it was a terrific place to work. It's uncommon, uh, Jim, I'm excited to get to you in a second. I just, I think the application here is so helpful because there's somebody I'm thinking of in particular that has a, he has a great career and he, 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 get, he goes hard, but he loves a lot of the reason he loves his career is because he has the autonomy and flexibility for a lot of other adventures. And so I think it's easy early on in your 20s to not think about kind of having discernment about like you don't have to go all in for one or the other. And hearing you flesh that out, I think it's, it's very helpful because I think if you feel like you have to go all in, then it can create even more potential fear or anxiety. And maybe that is for some people, but maybe some people kind of go down the path that you laid out, and, but they kind of understand their own convictions and principles about it. And I just think it's, it's really interesting hearing you flesh that out. Yeah, there's a lot of career advice or just sort of general talk that, you know, go to college, study what you're passionate about, find a way to work in the field that makes you really excited and want to get up in the morning. And that's a, that's a very viable option for people when they have the extreme good fortune that that can work. But it's not the only path. It's completely viable for me personally, and I think for others to say, I want my career to serve my personal life not for me to become obsessed and consumed by my career. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. What about you, Jim? Well, I was a recipient of immense good fortune purely by chance in terms of ending up in the career that I did, that 
I was at graduate school at Stanford and I was studying fine arts. I was a sculptor. And I spent most of my time making stuff down in the design division shop facilities. I lived there basically 24 seven. And I met a number of people there who were engaged in learning about product design and the design business. And one of them was David Kelly. And David was working on his master's in product design and we became good friends. I even dragged him up to the mountains a few times. <laughs> and David at one point mentioned offhand, he says, sometime I, I want to start a company and hire all my friends. Are you interested? And I, well, sure. Why not? <laughs> I had no idea what I was going to do. And he actually did start a company and he did hire a lot of his friends. And the company grew and ultimately became IDEO. And so I started there pretty much at the ground floor and basically a self-taught engineer. And I love the creative aspect of that. And I really, really, really enjoyed my job. And I really enjoyed working for that company for some of the same reasons Amy discussed, good colleagues, people who you liked as people outside of work, not just at work. For me, fascinating design problems to solve, interesting clients, uh, an opportunity to travel extensively. I, I, I don't know, I probably took 100 business trips outside the country during my career. During my career, I had many opportunities, many offers to go to other companies and start climbing the ladder of, oh, you know, you can start here and eventually you'll be vice president of engineering or something. And I declined them all because I really liked what I was doing and I had a good relationship with my company and they understood clearly that there was work and there was non-work and work could not take over, at least in my life, non-work. Mm -hmm. And I drew that line and I drew it hard and I never had an issue with that. They never got on me say, oh, yo, you got you to gotta work this weekend because we have this client that needs something like that. I said, no, I'm, you know, I've already got plans. Uh, I, that was never an issue. So I was extremely fortunate. And it's not a lot of places that allow you to have that personal autonomy and personal freedom to make those choices without some consequence to your career. So right place, right time, whatever. I benefited from that. Did you ever think about stopping and changing your career? No, no. I loved what I was doing. It was fascinating. I got up every morning and I rode my bike to work and um, I was happy to be there. How many miles did, did you ride to work? Uh, it was about five miles each direction. So. so you said you drew that line hard. So by drawing that line hard, you were able to take off two or so months a year and travel and doing it and do adventures? Well, toward the end of my career, I started working part-time to enable us to take more long distance travel. When I was working, they were very flexible on how we took our vacation time and our holiday time. So I would accumulate time for long trips. But I think up until 2002, I think all of our trips were 10 to 20 days. Would y'all take multiple ones of those a year? We were taking probably six weeks of vacation a year, maybe, you know, three two-week trips or three one-week trips and a three-week trips during up until about 2000. And then we did our first international long hike in 2002. Not completely correct. We, we, did, we went to Nepal much earlier. Yes, yeah. And we were but, out there for... Six weeks, but but mostly before 2000, our trips were one to two to three weeks, and probably total of about six weeks a year, with some exceptions that were more. Since then, we discovered international hiking in 2002 was our first international hike. Well, we had gone to Nepal, which was a separate kind of a thing, um, and that was a special trip for a sabbatical I had. After 2002, we started taking overseas hikes of four to six weeks each. And I think we've taken one or two every year since then. Almost every year. Yeah. 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 In addition to wilderness hikes in the U.S. 
and the and paddling the Mississippi and some bicycle trips as well. Right. You've cycled four thousand miles. <laughs> <laughs> You walked fourteen thousand two hundred and twenty three more than that because that's only only recorded nine countries plus the United States, so that's ten countries. Yeah. That's not day hikes. Yeah. And then you can and that, that doesn't also include Co Park. Is that a federal or state park close to your home? Henry Co Park is a state park close to our home. It's the second largest state park in California. So I d I didn't include that. Uh, we spent about three hundred days at Co. Over the years, yeah, we've probably walked five thousand miles just at Co. Yeah, so now we're over twenty thousand. So <laughs> that's how we get around the world. I'm glad you're doing the addition for us. I don't. This think- has been fun. I mean, you never know where exactly these podcasts go, but I've never had so much fun just crunching numbers this morning <laughs> and looking up all these countries and looking up the mileage covered. I mean, I felt like I just got a glimpse of being a part of it by just looking at everything. Well, I'm a I'm a kind of an obsessive collector kind of person, and so I've been spending a lot of time recently doing a lot of mapping of trips, in particular spending time in the Sierra and mapping all of our walks there, dating back to day zero, at least as much as I can reconstruct them. And um, I reached now about 3,400 miles of travel on foot in the Sierra alone. Jeez. So it adds up, you know, if you keep going, it put a... 80 mile trip and a 60 mile trip and a hundred mile trip and you do enough of them eventually you get some big numbers yeah so i've got some research here for that being a perfect segue jim i i watched a video of you with audio and you talked about where you were self-taught and that no one starts as a master builder and then amy i've heard you talk about that you enjoy the rhythm of moving forward and the difference between pushing the tempo for pace versus moving at a pace that reflects the love of the experience. So to kind of take what you just said, can you talk about maybe some of the early days early on, even though you had so much experience, how you just got going and then you can look back now and you're still going and see that you're over 20,000 miles in. Well, let me start and we'll see where this goes. For both of us, with some exceptions that aren't important, we really spent most of our time on wilderness backpacking trips, often off trail, in the Sierras, in southern Utah, and in other parts of the country. And on a wilderness backpacking trip, you're carrying everything you need except water. And in our case, we frequently traveled off trail. And that kind of trip is a is a different mindset and a different rhythm than being on a trail with resupply um, because you start the trip carrying everything you're going to need. And at every point, if you're off trail, you're making decisions about, do I go this way? Do I go that way? Is that pass going to be viable? If we're going over that pass using binoculars and studying it, which, which, you know, what's the approach? On a trail, you're really not making any decisions at all. You have a, a long line in front of you you know, maybe 500 kilometers or 1,000 kilometers. And we don't make reservations and we don't stay indoors. We just sleep in our tent. So literally every morning you wake up and you just put on your pack and you start walking. And because you're following a line, you don't have to think about anything. And it's just extremely relaxing, freeing experience to just be out there and observing and experiencing everything around you. Whereas on wilderness trips, you're paying attention, you're making decisions, you're thinking it through. What I felt like I heard you say is you're talking about the difference between really going off trail and then when you, when you do stay on the trail, it requires no thinking, but when you go off trail and how many miles you have done off trail that's where there's more complexity. That's where there's more decision making. I think there's there's probably no right or wrong answer, but I'm curious, is there something there that maybe you've seen that makes you think about just the years of staying in it and the years of becoming a master builder? Like what what did I ask that made you go there to where you're talking about the differences between the two? I think the reason I went there, you asked about sort of transitions and becoming a master builder. 
Yes, ma'am. We started with, in some sense, what's the hardest hiking to do, which is wilderness backpacking, where if you didn't bring what you needed, you don't have it. And if you're on an off-trail route and you can't go forward because you've come to a pass that you can't ascend, you have to retreat out. So in a sense, we started with what's, from a hiking point of view, the most challenging. And subsequently, later in life, added long-distance trail walking, which in many ways is much easier. So we still enjoy both of them immensely. And it's possible that our wilderness, our, our foundation in wilderness travel made us very prepared for, for trail walking. I mean, it, trail walking is a breeze. It's not complicated. And it's the satisfaction of it being stress-free, both from a decision-making point of view and a physical challenge point of view. It's kind of like dessert. <laughs> <laughs> like we did the hard work up front and okay. then keeping the rewards. Yeah. I'll expand on that a little bit. Part of what's involved in the, these kinds of activities is the physical skills to be able to go across whatever terrain you cho choose to do, either being able to ride a bike down a dirt trail or to be able to physically paddle a canoe or be able to do class two, class three, climbing off trail. Part of it is just the day-to-day -day maintenance. What kind of equipment do you take? How do you choose a campsite? How do you find clean water? How do you keep bears out of your pack? And all the sort of background stuff that you need to know to be able to do this successfully and not have a crisis in the middle of a trip. And we made a conscious effort throughout our careers to learn things about this, try new techniques, uh, new technology, new equipment. And after a while, and I can't tell you when this transition occurred, but after a while it becomes second nature. You don't even think about it. And so when Amy's talking about trail walking as being low stress, that includes there's no stress associated with the day-to-day -day tasks of living. I mean, we take these long trips. We don't know where we're going to camp. It's 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, depending on when it gets dark. We'll start thinking about we need to find a campsite. And you know no matter where you are, you'll always be able to find a reasonably decent place to camp. And this can be in the Sierras, it can be in the backcountry in Utah, it can be in Italy, it can be in France, it can be in England in the rural countryside. And you know that you're going to find a place and it's going to work out. And so that kind of stress kind of disappears, yeah. enabling you to spend more time just enjoying what you're doing. And those are skills. And those are skills that you learn over time. You make mistakes, and we made plenty of them. And uh, you correct them, and you move on. So what specific skills that you're talking about that you learn over time that you just referenced there? Um, let me build on that. I just listened to a podcast about a hiking trip somebody took on a hiking podcast of some sort. And it was about... I had heat stroke and I couldn't find grocery stores and I, the soles came off my shoes and it was presenting a lot of the challenges, uh, the challenges that he had. Jim and I have a standing joke about outdoor magazine or backpacker magazine adventure articles. The first paragraph always has, I almost died, you know, the lightning this or the something that. And we have kind of a standing joke, like we'll have five or six weeks on the trail. And the biggest challenge we had was that the pub we expected to be open was closed. <laughs> We've done it enough that we know how to find stores and we know, just as an example, you asked for specifics. We spent a month hiking in Scotland, which is a wet country, and it was 150% of normal rainfall that month. So it was just saturated. I mean, wet. All the, all the time wet. And we know how to set up camp when it's raining and when all our clothes are wet and get into the tent and mop everything out and get ourselves dry and keep our dry stuff dry. So it's not necessarily fun, but it's not, you know, it's not something we would report as we almost died, the rainstorm did this and this and this. Something related to this is that with the exception of the Mississippi River trip, which we should come back to, for our hiking trips, we're not creating a trip for the purpose 
of challenging our skills or our ability. Like some people will start and say, I want to hike the Pacific Crest Trail this year because it's a big challenge and I don't know if, if I can do it and it focuses my energy and it gives me a huge sense of accomplishment. For the most part, we're taking trips because we love being outdoors. It's not taking them for the purpose of testing our abilities. Because those abilities grew up over so many years, you know, we know how to set up in the rain. We know Jim broke his leg on one of our trips. Fortunately, not as complicated as my ankle fracture, but it took us a couple of days to get out because we were in the back country and it was before the days of communications. Sheesh. But it wasn't freaky. You know, it was just like, well, this is a great big pain in the neck. And the Mississippi River is a whole different deal of going into something where we had some of the skills, like the camping skills and the feeding ourselves skills. But Mississippi River is a, is a you know, it's a big river. And um, we had never been in a canoe together prior to that. I had done quite a lot of flat water canoeing as a child. I grew up in the Great Lakes area and, you know, summer camps in Lake Michigan itself. But Jim had not done much canoeing and we'd never canoed together. So that was a very different thing. We're starting that. We didn't actually know if we could succeed. And we didn't know. We had an intellectual understanding of the challenges we would face. But we didn't, we hadn't experienced them in the past. Unlike hiking where we don't really face challenges that are completely new to us. Other than languages. and foreign. Other than languages, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It sounds like. You know, that was a step up from a sense of, of a risk standpoint or potential discomfort early on. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating that, but just the way that you just said that. Is that true? Well, the Mississippi happened purely by accident. We have a, an Internet friend who's a German woman who, uh, when she was in her late 30s or so, decided she liked spending her life outdoors. So she sold her house, quit her job, and has basically spent her life outdoors ever since then. She's remarkable. <laughs> you want to talk about mildness. You talk about yeah. Christine. Yeah. She, yeah. She's a phenomenon. And we've communicated with her a number of times over various routes that we've done or she's done. And I was looking at one of her posts, and she said, I just paddled the Mississippi River. It's a fabulous trip. I don't understand why more Americans don't use this great resource. And I read the story and Christine's not a very skilled paddler per se. And she was just did it. And I came in to Amy, I said, Christine paddled the Mississippi river. We should go do this. And Amy said, okay. Oh my goodness. It was literally that fast that we made the decision. It was, it was that fast. Christine, We've read a lot of her trip reports, and we understand and respect her assessments already. So it wasn't a random piece of advice, but she literally on her website said, I don't know why Americans go to other countries to paddle rivers. This is a phenomenal river, and it's achievable with basic skills. So we just literally in five minutes, we decided it had never occurred to me. Never, it never, ever occurred to me. And I grew up in Chicago and spent a lot of time in Wisconsin and Minnesota. I paddled up in Quetico Boundary Waters and um, just never, it was totally off the radar that you could paddle the Mississippi River. Yeah. So there's a number of things you need to understand about that river. First of all, it's basically a flatwater river. There are, you don't have to have advanced skills running white water for that river because there is no white water. There's one tiny set of rapids somewhere, I don't know, several hundred miles in, but the rest of it is flat. So that skill level of handling a canoe is not required. Second of all, when you start the Mississippi, you're towing your canoe down a stream. You're, it's not even deep enough when we were there to float the canoe with us in it. Huh. And so it gradually builds and builds and builds. And by the time you reach the Gulf, it's gigantic. And it was flowing at a million cubic feet per second, which is an enormous amount of water. But you don't start there. You start on the little tiny stream, and then it's a, a marsh, then you're paddling through the marsh in very shallow water, and then it's actually a river, but it's a really narrow river. And so you learn as you're going down 
more about handling a canoe and how you have to deal with the issues of canoe camping versus land camping and all the other stuff. So it's a gradual introduction. And so by the time where the river gets sizable and frankly intimidating, you've been on it for weeks and know something about the water, something about your canoe and the tools you have in the canoe and your paddling partner. And so it's not like jumping in just into this huge situation where you have not, you know, have no idea what you're doing. And the other thing is that most of the issues there are predictable. Things on a flat water river don't happen really quickly in general. That the towboats that are your biggest potential hazard on the big water are moving really, really slowly. They're not racing up to you and running you over. You see them a long way away and you can get out of their way. You can give them plenty of space. They say there's no real white water to deal with. So you're not, you're, the river's moving at two to three miles an hour. That's pretty slow water. Wow. Hey, everybody. We're going to take a quick pause here from the show and hear a word from one of our sponsors. After that, we'll get back to the show. Do you want to make efficient use with your time? Now more than ever, traveling hassle-free is harder to find. AB Jets is one of the safest private air companies in the world with impeccable service with nonstop access to most destinations around the USA. AB Jets has received the prestigious Argus Platinum rating the last eight consecutive years, which goes to less than 5% of operators in the world. Bypass the hassle and get an AB Jets jet card. It gets you 10 or 25 hour flight options that makes your experience hassle free. AB Jets carries up to eight passengers and is one of the largest Lear 60 operators in the US. Go to abjets.com for more information or call them at 888-520-JETS. That's J-E-T-S to travel on your own terms. There's so many things that you just shared about the stages of the river and where it starts to where it ends up that matches other things that you've shared so far on this episode. How do y'all, from a relationship standpoint, I mean, obviously y'all have been clear about when y'all met and y'all's mutual love for the outdoors, but do y'all ever get in just fights out on the trail or on the river? And uh, I mean, if that does happen, what is like tension that can happen just within marriages? How does that flesh itself out when you're out in the middle of nowhere? I'll take that one. <laughs> yeah, please. So Jim may have understated how obsessively driven he can be. <laughs> so when I met him and we started taking day hikes together, he literally didn't stop walking from sunrise to sunset. Because if you stop for lunch, that's time that you're not spending getting over the hill to see what's on the other side. So one of our first conflicts was figuring out like we have this 90% overlap and then we have 10%, which is completely unacceptable. <laughs> like, this is not going to happen. You know, we are taking a mid morning break. We are having lunch. We are having a mid afternoon snack. <laughs> and like you said, marriages or relationships with work or anything, you have a, you have a zone of overlap where it comes naturally and that's what you build on. And then you have the parts where it's, not it's mutually exclusive and that's where the negotiations are so our biggest initial one was not about whether we go sunrise to sunset which we both enjoyed and not even about our walking pace which is the same we walk at the same pace but how often and how many breaks are we taking and um we we navigated through that okay yeah well it's it wasn't just one-sided on my part accepting the fact that we're going to eat lunch <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when we first started walking on our first trips to Henry Co, I'd plan a trip and they were somewhat shorter than I might have done on my own. And I'd get Amy out there. And she says, you're going to make me walk 12 miles today. I don't walk 12 miles. <laughs> and the next time we'd go out and it would be 13 miles or 14 miles or 15 miles. And after a while, she was perfectly capable and happy walking very long distances. Yeah. Uh, at a, not at a ridiculous pace. 
So that was a unspoken compromise we made yeah. as well, that she was willing to put in the full day. Yeah. And um, so it's, it's a trade-off. Yeah. And if you love your partner, you do these things. Yeah. I'll speak to that trade-off. One of the things I loved about Jim and continue to love about Jim is his passion for getting as much out of life as possible. Mm. Not stopping for lunch is an example of that. Literally, if you stop for lunch, then we don't get to see what's around that bend. And what's around that bend might be, you know, horsehair worms or who knows what. <laughs> <laughs> so part of wanting to get as much out of life as possible is being at the trailhead at sunrise. Because sunrise is the start of the day. And I thought that was completely crazy. And then once you do it five or 10 or 15 times and you find that sunrise is just the absolutely best time of day, um, I wouldn't have gotten there on my own. I wouldn't have gotten there without him saying, of course, we're going to be at the trailhead at sunrise because, you know, the day is, if you wait until nine o'clock, you've lost a quarter of the day. So that was something where I absolutely benefited. My life definitely got better once I learned that sunrise is fantastic yeah and the birds are better first thing in the morning too and once you got once we've seriously got into birding as part of this activity that became important to be there so you could see the birds has there ever been a season where you wanted to quit an adventure or a, an excursion i i did quit one i did a trip without jim i had done quite a lot of bicycling bicycle touring when i was in high school and college and really enjoyed being out on a bicycle. Jim had done a lot of day recreational riding, but had never done touring. And I was hankering to have a bike ride, and he was busy at work. So I signed up for a cross-country ride in a group and loved the riding. But as it turned out, the route that we were following was not satisfying and in some ways quite unsafe on roads where we didn't belong. And I rode as far as just past Chicago, um, saw my family as we rode near Chicago. And in Indiana, we were on roads we absolutely didn't belong on. And one of the riders was hit by a car. Um, and I just called my family and said, this is not working. I mean, I ride a bicycle to have fun, not to be stressed out. And I was the only one on the trip who, uh, who ducked out the other riders were, many of them said, look, I signed up to achieve a dream of a lifetime to ride across the country, and I'm this far, and I'm not going to let go of it. For me, I was, and this, you know, is back to my personality, I was riding for the joy of the riding, not to achieve the goal of going from ocean to ocean. So that was an easy thing. It was an easy choice for me. And I think Jim would have made the other choice because for him, the achievement, it's hard to know. He wasn't there, but. Well, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, I don't, I don't think that's quite fair in the sense that there on many of our wilderness trips, when we reach a situation oh. where I feel that it's either unsafe for me or more importantly, unsafe for Amy, we turn back. Mm -hmm. there's, there's been any number of yeah. summit attempts in the Sierras that we've abandoned because the rock climbing got to a point where the risk wasn't worth it for us. That technically mm -hmm. I knew I had the skills to do it, but Amy has less skills and she is more um, nervous on these kinds of things. So we just say, okay, we'll turn back. And sometimes we tried it another day and other times we just, that's, that's the way it goes. So I don't believe that we, just go out and, you know, we're going to do this come hell or high water. No, we don't do that. Which is why you've been able to do this for so long. Why we're still alive. <laughs> Jim, I've heard you talk about with your work at IDEO, you talked about failure itself is not a good thing, but being willing to fail is good because that means you're willing to learn. Yes. So from an adventure standpoint, from an outdoor standpoint with you and Amy, can you just maybe speak on that mindset and what that looks like and how that's guided you? Well, I'm much more goal oriented than Amy is. When I, when we start a trip, I really want to get to the end and I want to I follow the route I've designed. 
I spend a lot of time designing the routes, though. So I have a fairly good idea of what the level of uh, objective hazards are and how long it might take and where we're going to go. And also the areas that are higher risk. And if there's a problem, what are the backup points going to be? What do we do to get around this particular issue? So we're not just trapped. So researching is part of the pleasure for me of doing a trip. And it's also part of the risk mitigation part of the trip. So we know what to expect. And I think that that's, a, that's an important thing. And I think also, as I say, we've got reasonably good skills. So if something unexpected happens, we are fairly confident in our ability to deal with it. We just took, during COVID, we took a backcountry trip in the Sierras. And most routes in the Sierras are pretty well documented, passes and ridge walks and summits. And to make, to make a COVID trip possible, we couldn't hitchhike from trailhead to trailhead. So we had to design a loop hike. And the loop included traversing a ridge that there was no data we could find. So we had that in our itinerary. And when we got to that ridge, it was clear that it was not something that was going to be possible to traverse. And we backed out and sort of reacquired our route at a different place. So your, your question about being willing to fail and designing for failure we attempted that ridge knowing that failure was a very good possibility. In some ways, it's not really a failure. It's acknowledgement that it didn't work. Yeah. Another trip we were taking uh, was late fall. And the weather report for the time we were going to be out was actually very, very good. And we had gone in to Yosemite. We had spent the day. We had climbed a couple of peaks. And then we had gone followed an off-trail route down the backside of one of these peaks down a fairly steep couloir and found a campsite. And that night it just dumped. It snowed, I don't know, what, 18 inches on us? Jeez. And it, well, it, it's in the middle of the night, it just, the wind turned on. I mean, we went to, we went to bed after dark. It was sitting out, you know, watching the moon and calm and glorious. We had a weather forecast that was two days old that was, didn't include any troublesome weather. Yeah. And something shifted. Yeah. So we woke up in the morning and everything is covered with snow. And it's snowing. And it's still snowing. And we decided, okay, that the smartest thing to do is to abandon the rest of the trip and retrace our steps as well as we could. And we were able to do that. We were able to climb back up the steep gully that we had descended and they were able to travel travel across country and eventually get down to where the snow was less deep and pick up some trails and get out that was no big deal but the thing that was made a difference for us was that even though the weather report had said it's going to be great weather we were prepared for the fact that it could something could happen Hmm. and there were any number of other people that weekend, there were several people who died. Oh my gosh. And any number of other people had to be many. rescued. Many, many people had to be rescued. In most cases, because they simply weren't prepared for the fact that if you go into the Sierras in late October, it could snow, even if the weather forecast says it's good. Yeah. And so the planning for, you know, in a sense, the fact that it snow was a failure on the trip part. We weren't able to continue what we we're doing. But it wasn't a life-threatening situation for us because we had hats and gloves and maps and raincoats and rain pants and warm clothes and, and could could yeah. deal with this, these contingencies. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people get in trouble when they plan for what the best possible outcome might be instead of what for a maybe not likely but other possible outcome might be. Yeah. And so we try to do all of our trips thinking about, okay, what are the contingencies? And failure itself, I mean, I think back to my IDEO days, and one of the things that David said frequently was fail early, fail often, so you can learn. And I was fortunate to work for a company where if you made an honest effort and it was a failure, there was no penalty. 
there was nobody saying, oh, you know, you derailed your career or you're a really stupid person or whatever. There was like, no, what can we learn from this and how do we move on? And I think that can easily apply to any kind of outdoor activities mm -hmm. because you'll inevitably run into problems. Mm -hmm. You know, a piece of equipment will break or you'll miss a turn on a trail or you're in a foreign country, you know, you don't know what the restaurants are because you can't read the signs. And so mm -hmm. you adapt. Yes, sir. And how you're talking about these principles that y'all have and how it applies to every adventure I'm curious, when you when y'all sit down and you're planning for a trip and you're looking at it, can you talk about the questions that you either ask Amy or you ask yourself to where you try to plan not just for the best possible outcome, but also for the worst possible outcome, and then how you prepare for that and how you pack? How do you do that? Well, packing packing is fairly easy because we have a standard kit that we take on almost every trip, it doesn't vary. Every hiking trip, obviously the canoe is different. And that, as Jim says, it includes being able to stay warm and dry, you know, when it's 20 degrees, even if you think it's gonna be over 50 all the time. And we have a checklist, we have a spreadsheet that we yeah. continually keep updated before yeah. every trip. We go down that list and tick off every item so we yeah. don't do something stupid, and forget something. Planning some trips, for instance, we do a lot of backcountry hiking in southern Utah, and one of the issues there is water. And so when, before we start a trip, I'll have researched as much as possible what the potential water sources are and how likely they are to have water and what is the backup. So we know in any particular segment, to be safe, we have to carry this much water. Right. If we know for sure we're gonna reach the Escalante River, we can carry less water because we know the Escalante is always flowing. If we're crossing an upland there and there's potholes, but it's been dry, we don't assume those potholes will have water. So we carry more water than we need. And it seems like common sense, but we've seen examples where it doesn't always apply. Yeah. So like with the Sierras, if I'm understanding you correctly, you look at the weather, you look at it a few days out, and you're thinking in your head, it's almost like, what is the outcome that I'm expecting or that I'm wanting out of this trip? But then you also ask the question, what could happen or what's a variable that can make this outcome much different and worse? And like with the snow, that's what saved y'all's life compared to other people's. Let me summarize an article I read 25 years ago called Why People Die in the Wilderness. And it was a study of Mount Washington in New Hampshire, which is a um, horrifically dangerous mountain just because of the weather. Weather there is extreme. And whoever the organization that was doing the research analyzed all of the deaths in the last 20 years. And pretty much all of them were people who prepared for the conditions that they expected. Mm. And those expectations were, you know, I've come here every September you know, since I was 10 years old, and it's always like this. And then, you know, they're 55 years old, and they've been there 25 times, and it's always been one way. Um, and they were caught off guard. So part of that preparation is not succumbing to, you know, because my experience has been X, this is what I'm going to expect. And to really absorb that the experience can be something that's totally different than you've ever had there. That example that you gave. I mean, and you can apply this to all aspects of life. It's yeah. what I'm hearing from y'all is asking the critical questions on the on the front end. You know, what's the opposite of the subconscious outcome that we're desiring going into it? And then how do we account for that? I, I would like to add that I mentioned this earlier, the fact that we have turned back. And that I think I'd like to reemphasize that because it's so hard when you're close to achieving a goal to say, I'm not going to take this risk. I'm going to ignore this risk and I want to achieve my goal. And there's, there's really high end mountaineers and so forth who that's their lifestyle. They, they take those risks and I don't begrudge them doing that. I think of Alex Hunold and his uh, free ascent of El Capitan total risk from the time he was 10 feet off the ground. I mean, just complete, you make the slightest mistake and you're dead. Remarkable achievement, but that's not us. That 
we we don't have that mindset. And I think for most people who don't have Alex's skill and mental control, they need to accept the fact that they may not make that summit and it's time to turn back. And it's so hard for people to do because you're so close. And so many accidents and so many fatalities in the mountains have occurred because somebody won't turn back when it's time to turn back. That's interesting the way you describe that because me personally – I am adventurous, but I'm not nearly as strong-willed, I don't think, mentally the way that you are. And like three weeks ago, we were doing this adventure, and I I was kind of uncomfortable about it. And I was really inclined to just skip it, uh, skip what what I was looking at doing. But I was just like, screw it, I'm going for it. And it wasn't crazy irresponsible, but it's that voice of how do you know how to listen to that voice? Because some people have more gas in the tank, I think, like me in that situation, to where the overall risk factor wasn't that high. But then sometimes people can be reckless to some degree. It it costs you. And I think it's interesting. You know, I was a rafting guy out on the Klamath uh, north of y'all. And I'm from Tennessee. So getting out on the Klamath, even like jumping from pretty good distances off the river, it was incredibly uncomfortable. But it was the best experience of my life in running that river was amazing, but it's just it's just interesting the dichotomy between the application of that. Sam, let me tie in a lesson that I learned when I was a manager and in one of my sort of manager training sessions was a framework about learning a new skill of starting with unconscious incompetence where you don't you don't know what you don't know. You don't know how to assess what the risks are. You don't even know that you're in over your head because it's completely new with the sports analogy being, you know, a a six-year-old playing T-ball and not even knowing that they're supposed to run around and touch the bases, but they're having a great time. Um, The second stage being conscious incompetence, when you now know enough about what that thing is to realize how little you know. And at that stage, in, in terms of outdoor adventure, you're starting to realize, hey, there's risks here that last year, I didn't, you know, I did this thing last year, and I thought I was safe. And now I'm realizing I'm not really safe. And the third stage of conscious competence, where you've really studied and worked hard and learned it and understand what's what. And the fourth stage of unconscious competence, where you don't really have to study and work hard and pay attention, you you have that skill, and it just happens. So some of these, with outdoor adventure, these people who are at the first stage of unconscious incompetence, you know, they've read about people paddling the Mississippi or whatever it is, and they think, oh, I could do that. And in fact, they probably can do that. But if they don't study enough to realize that river is definitely going to kill you if you don't respect it and treat it properly. It's, you know, it's not a safe river. It doesn't have whitewater, but it's not a safe river in that those barge toes don't see you. And if you're in their way, you're just under nobody knows i mean you're right you're, you're gone so the mississippi river is actually a really good demonstration you could easily think i'm going to go canoe that river and, and end up dying just for lack of appreciating that it's risky whereas for us we had never done anything like that but we're really cautious and we did a lot of research we read a lot we understood things we carried a marine radio we learned how to communicate and we, uh, obviously, we didn't die. <laughs> we weren't in front of a, of a barge toad the size of a small city, you know. But I think that transition from, I'm going to do an adventure, and, and I don't even know how to recognize what the risks are, those people can get themselves into trouble. If they've built into that experience so that they can recognize the risks, even though they've never experienced them. My example with Mount Washington even though I've hiked Mount Washington 50 times and it's never had 120 mile an hour winds, I have read that that happens and I'm going to respect it and be prepared for it. That's a a very helpful distinction. It comes up for us because with our website, we occasionally get emails from somebody saying, I'm thinking about doing this trip and, you know, I have a question about A, B, or C. And the question is so novice that you can sort of realize this this person is coming from a place where they might get in over their head. Right. 
So we try to be honor that and respect it and help people get themselves into the right place. It sounds like there's an intrinsic amount of drive and interest, and I don't mean drive in some crazy competitive way, but for the activity, for the adventure that has created many years of experiences in adventures, et cetera. So there's a, there's an amount of determination there, but then a healthy amount of skepticism. And so Jim, the way that you were talking about preparation, planning, et cetera, that combination with the longevity of the time frame of the adventures themselves. And Amy, what I'm hearing you say is if somebody's just going to come in and read about y'all doing this, or read about somebody else doing it and say, oh, okay, well, I want to go ahead and do it. That's where the disaster may be more likely to happen because there, there's just not the preparation, but then there's also not the experiences that have compounded over time. Right. On, on some trips, we've taken many, many trips that a complete novice could do and not be you know, not risk anything. But some of the trips we've taken are not appropriate for for novices. Has y'all's lifestyle and the experiences, have you had to sacrifice anything? (sighs) I don't think anything of major importance for us where we've had to make some decision A Mm -hmm. or B and they both have really strong values Mm -hmm. and it's hard to choose between them. I mean, you're constantly making trivial choices. I mean, should we go to Spain or should we go to France? And those, in the end, that doesn't matter. It's there's no (laughs) sacrifice. But we also, I mean, our lifestyle is relatively simple compared to many of our peers. We uh, don't have a lot of what I guess you might consider a consumerist orientation. Right. And so we're not trading off doing this versus something else. We're doing the things that we want to do. And yeah. so, yeah, I, I mean, there's, there, for me, there's a constant tension of, you know, I want to go here because I, I, I haven't been there. And so we need to do a trip there. And Amy wants to go back to the same places that she's been before because she's like them. So there, yeah. there is that sacrifice that we have to trade off. I think to your question of have we made major sacrifices, I can't emphasize enough how incredibly lucky we've been in life. I mean, just the good fortune that both of us had to end up in jobs that we loved, that had paychecks, in both cases, things that we had not studied or intended to do that were compl- really just random good chance. That good fortune doesn't happen to a lot of people. So we both had careers that we enjoyed. We didn't have health problems. We didn't really have any crises in our life. And that's not through any, you know, hard work on our part. That's just, we were just lucky. Yes. This is a weird question, or it may be weird to y'all, but do y'all drink alcohol? I drink alcohol, one drink maximum because I don't like the feeling of being inebriated and not every day. Yeah. I've, I've kind of stopped. I I was never an excessive drinker. I would have a glass of wine with dinner, but for the last, I don't know, year or two, I just kind of stopped and not for a moral reason or a health reason or anything else. It just stopped interesting me. The reason I asked is I usually only drink alcohol, maybe Friday, Saturday night, Sometimes I might have a few beers on Sunday, Sunday evening, something like that. But it's crazy how our, for me personally and some others that I know, even if I'm just going to do a, like a, a few nights of a trip, just the craving for either certain foods or certain drinks or whatever, it's like the cell phone. It's crazy how it, and what I'm thinking about as y'all were talking is the freedom that y'all have by being away, by being on the trail, by being unplugged. And then the, the experiences that you have with your own thoughts, which then lead to your convictions, which lead to your principles, et cetera, the simplicity of that. And I think that's where a lot of us just day to day people like listening to this or, you know, all the people around the world, we, we get so dominated by the systems that y'all talked about early on and the freedom from all of that provides abundance 
in a lot of different ways. And I mean, even me being on the river, I, there was a trip I did this summer and I love having a few cold beers like at night after we paddled all day and it's hot, but just that I was being such a baby about not having some beers because we couldn't take that weight with us. And, and I'm just like, golly, I'm soft. Uh, and it's just, I think it's neat hearing you, you flesh that out about y'all's own personal choices. I will say that our diet on our backpacking trips is pretty rudimentary, and there's a lot of craving for food. Lettuce. <laughs> and, and, and Ben and Jerry's fish food. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so so it's, it's not all a bed of roses. That <laughs> but, I, but I think that spending a lot of time backpacking does clarify what's necessary and what's not necessary and probably the same on the river right because you have everything you're going to have backpacking because you're carrying it on your back it's it's not much that you've got you know meals are not anything exciting to look forward to it's just calories and that does carry over into the rest of the life and it's so easy for all of us to take for granted what we have and always be looking at that next five percent or the next ten percent or you know, I have this great ice cream, but I really would be better if it had, you know, this hot fudge sauce on it or something. We're always seeking the next. And it is a good grounding to spend 10 days in the backcountry and realize you really don't need very much. You know, you need 2,500 calories a day and it doesn't much matter where they come from or 3,000 calories a day. And it's easy to let go of all those excessive cravings well easier for you <laughs> <laughs> so when when y'all when y'all get those cravings of ben and jerry's or i forgot what the other thing that you said was you might have read lettuce. It off. lettuce mentally how do you deal with that i mean i know your options are it's impossible where you are but i'm curious how have you learned to confront that there's no confrontation you, no. Can't, you can't have it so <laughs> i mean it's you can you can tell stories about it or joke about it, but it's... Yeah, what you've got in your pack is what you've got. Okay, earlier you talked about marital conflict. So <laughs> Jim consistently thinks that I'm the slowest eater on the planet. Uh -huh. Until we're on a trip and we stop at a store that has Ben and Jerry's fish food, and then you get a pint of ice cream and two spoons. And so now he is absolutely convinced that I'm eating three quarters of the pint. <laughs> In the rest of my life, I'm the slowest eater on the planet. Yeah, but she, she, can, she can go through ice cream like nobody's business. Well, I'm, in, I'm impressed that y'all that y'all didn't get one pint each. I think we will next time. <laughs> well, you, you realize it's two in the afternoon and you still got some miles to go, and you don't need a whole pint of ice cream weighting you down. Yeah, but you might want one. You might want one, but yeah, I'm the kind of personality where I'd eat it, and then I'd, about 20 minutes from then, I'd I'd be regretting it, but. Well, that's one, of the, that's one of the real advantages of doing a walk in uh, non-wilderness areas as there are grocery stores and pubs and you can go in and you can get a nice beer or you can get a pint of ice cream and um, it can be part of the experience. So uh, wilderness is, is wonderful. It's got its advantages and it's got its unique place, but a lot of our trips are wilderness and we love those just as much. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious. I do have a, a question that I would like to ask before we wrap our time up together, but is there anything that we have not talked about that you think is important or that you're learning now that you want to make sure that we cover while we're together this afternoon? I'd say for me, uh, life is shorter than you think and you get older faster than you think. And as you get older, you start to run into limitations and that you should think about your options when you're young and about what really, really, really is important to you and then figure out a way to make the trade-offs necessary to at least scratch some of that itch. Don't get caught up in, well, everybody does this this way, so that's the way I should do it. Find out what's what you value and work to achieve those things. Jim, so what you just said when you look back at your time when you were young, have you changed that much in who you were inside? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, most of my change is due to my wife, and that's been very favorable. Uh, she's taught me a lot more patience. She's taught me to value things that I didn't previously value, value experience more than I did. She's taught me a lot about kindness and just being nice. And so I give her great credit for that. 
there are things that I wish I had done when I was younger. Now, when I look back, that I probably can't do now. Mostly around revolving around travel and adventure. That I'm just not don't have the physical condition that I used to. That I probably couldn't pull off. And uh, I try not to let those regrets overwhelm the great times we have had. So we all make mistakes. We move on. Mm -hmm. You talked about prioritizing the things that you care the most about when you're young and sticking to those and, and not sacrificing those. I'm curious, are you still in some degree the way that you are today, the way you were then when you were younger? I, th I think I am. There are some travel experiences that I really wish I had done when I was younger and now that I, I probably can't do. And they, I didn't do them for various reasons that at the time maybe were more rational than emotional. And um, so I carry a few of those regrets. And I think part of it was just not identifying what was the most important things at the time about me. And maybe we don't know. Maybe I changed. And maybe this is just retrospective. Who knows? Yeah. So you didn't ask, but one thing that we did not sacrifice, but for many people is a hard decision, is whether to have children. So we independently chose to not have children. And that has given us time to pursue other things that people with children don't have. That for us was not, a, we didn't say, hey, we really, really want to do a lot of travel and children won't be compatible with that, so we'll sacrifice that option. We chose to not have children for other reasons. So I just want to say that, you know, that's an enormous sacrifice or an enormous decision that many people have to make that was not a sacrifice for us. I can't really think of anything in my life that I felt like I compromised or sacrificed. I mean, I, like I said, I've just been just really fortunate. Yeah, uh, I second that. We've been extremely fortunate. That is great. Last question I have, Jim, I've heard you talk about from, a, from an engineering standpoint, the ability to look at your work critically, but also receiving input from others. But I'm curious. How are y'all looking to hand over your intellect that y'all have to someone else when it comes to these experiences, these adventures, in the way that, Jim, you talked about that from a professional engineering standpoint? I think a little bit of it is, is the website we've put up there, which is hopefully offering people some options of other ways to travel by human power that we are trying to share some of our points of view and some of the kinds of things that we do without making it hopefully not really about us, but more about what the experience could be. Other than that, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, 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 don't, I don't really have a way of doing that. We take people out whenever they want to go. Huh. So we share that. I mean, we took our nephew on one of our trips to uh, Utah and introduced him to that and hopefully he'll he got something out of that and but oh uh, it's it, it's a difficult question you know essentially how do you make your mark in the world and how do you how do you make it better how how are we making the world better for our having been here i hope we are i hope that we're offering inspiration and giving people confidence again as jim said through our website it, so to back up a little bit we with Christine's Mississippi River comment as an example, we have benefited enormously from people who've shared their trip reports, particularly those who share reports with their assessment about what the route is like and with information about that, how to do that trip. We took very, very seriously the task of building a website that would give back to the community what we had drawn from it of usable, clear information about places that most people have never gone um, because we've taken hikes, not necessarily spectacular or outrageous hikes, but just to places sometimes quite obscure that people haven't heard of that we thought were fantastic. So we're trying to put information out there so that people can feel inspiration and confidence to go try something different. Yeah, I think one of the many things that y'all are teaching me and you're going to teach other people through hearing this conversation is y'all have made these hard choices. And even though they might not be quote unquote hard choices to you, 
y'all established years ago, your priorities and your values and you, you live by them. And from career standpoint, from those choices, from the trips you take, from how many miles you cover, et cetera, y'all are a living example of what happens when you, what you really can experience and how nature can truly impact your life and the ways that you've hashed out. And I think anybody that's listening can connect to the reasons and the things that cause them for really doing it. And then I also hear you talk about the joy that y'all have through your platform and your website on giving other people information to help them have the adventures that y'all have had, but to in a wise manner and in, in, in a manner of experience. And then the joy that y'all feel when you see pictures and hear reports from other people on their own journeys. And for, I mean, even me personally, I, I'm a thinker, but the way that y'all have laid out how to think about things very critically, especially early on is huge because years can go by very fast. And, you know, the more people that can hear what you're sharing or the principles that you've referenced, the more thought people can give in earlier on and really kind of understand without being conformed to a system or an environment that they don't really care that much about. And it, you just see that play out over and over again. I think that's a good, that's a good summary. Yep. Well, this has been so much fun. Thank you all for taking time this afternoon. I've had a blast and I get so much out of this. It's been really delightful to talk to you. Yes. And and thank you for reaching out to us. We it, uh, appreciate it. Yeah. Very interesting questions. And it's prompted us to think holistically about our, what our lives have been and what's remaining ahead of us. For more information, go to drivenbypodcast.com and subscribe to our weekly email list. Check out my show on Twitter, Instagram, and all other platforms at Sam P. Coates. If you like the show, spread the word and tell a friend and leave a review. This really does help.